recreational and commercial fishermen care deeply about fishing. They want to pass on their heritage to the next generation. They are proud of what's been accomplished. Because fish populations rebounded so quickly and the general productivity of the ocean off Oregon is so evident, fishermen are optimistic about the future. If you look at our ocean here, we do 12,000 tons of tuna a year. We've been doing that steadily. In the last five, six years, we've had record crab seasons. We've had sardines that's come back after 50 years. We haven't even seen them. All of a sudden, record harvest of sardines. We've got shrimp that's been, they haven't been record, but the record was set with, with like 300 boats. Now we're fishing with, what, maybe 35, 40 boats, and we're still producing a lot of shrimp. And we had, several years ago, four or five years ago, we had record salmon seasons. Now we've had disasters on the Klamath and, and the Sacramento, but if you look at that, that doesn't, that doesn't spell bad ocean. And uh, so we got a really healthy ocean. It's full of feed. The birds here, the pelicans stayed longer this year than they've, they usually stay. They've been here. In fact, they stayed so late, they almost didn't get out of here. So all those things indicate to me that the ocean's pretty healthy. And the more people learn about the, uh, the, the process of how these fisheries offshore are managed, uh, the more I hear from them that uh, things are going quite well. Uh, the overfished stocks, that, uh, the depleted stocks that have been designated as depleted are increasing. There's uh, strict rebuilding plans in effect uh, that are working. Overfishing is not occurring. So I view that as a success story. I think today Oregon has the best uh, ocean management system and we also have the cleanest fisheries in the world. We can still make improvements, but when you're looking at a, a film of someplace else in the world, don't think that's the way it's been done in Oregon because we've tried to do all kinds of innovations. We've showed you a few of them from salmon fishermen where they use a limited number of hooks and they only fish in deep water to the trawl foot ropes, to the mesh size, to the excluder devices in shrimp, to a hundred different ways that Oregon fishermen are trying to make their fisher fisheries more environmentally sensitive. Tremendous strides forward have been taken in the last 20 years. No one is saying the job is finished. Looking ahead, we face an entirely new set of challenges. In the near term, companies will be placing devices in the ocean to harness renewable energy. In time, many other new industrial uses of the ocean could compete for space in Oregon's ocean. In response, the state of Oregon is working with fishermen and coastal communities to prepare an ocean plan. Under Oregon law, through goal 19, offshore development must be steered away from sensitive marine habitats and fishing grounds. Our world-class coastal scenery also needs protection. The long-term challenges are global in nature. In our lifetimes, climate change and rising acidification levels of the ocean could trigger unwelcome changes to the marine environment. That's why even greater levels of cooperation are needed. Here's an example. At this historic meeting in 2008, fishermen involved with the four Oregon Seafood Commodity Commissions met to review marine reserve proposals. Efforts to share information between fishermen and scientists need to be expanded to all parts of the coast. In recent years, there have been stunning advances in oceanography. Several major oceanographic research projects are getting underway off the west coast. By pooling the knowledge and skill sets of fishermen and scientists, and by adequately funding oceanographic research, we have an unprecedented opportunity to comprehend and respond to new challenges. And remember, 
Oregon's streams and rivers eventually empty into the Pacific Ocean. Please do your part. Learn how you can protect water quality. We're off to a great start. We heard how amazing things can be accomplished when we work together. Join us as we write the next great chapter in Oregon history. and sustain what we do have here. I want to tell you, nobody can 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 deny the fact that tourism will be the 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 the, the bread earner of Malawi. If we can re realize some of these potentials that Malawi has, I want to tell you, tourism will be the greatest. And Forest Lake Limited is one such company that want to prove the country that we have this potential in the country and we think we can make it. Poaching poses a great threat to Malawi's wildlife population. Poaching is mostly for food or sale to commercial dealers. In the past years, the population of elephants, buffalo, hippo, lion, eland, hartebeest, Roan antelope, nyala, and reedbuck have declined significantly in protected areas due to poaching. Between 1969 to 1992, the entire population of 350 elephants at Majete Wildlife Reserves was lost 
to poach. The Department of National Parks and Wildlife is implementing a restocking program that is aimed at replenishing animal and plant stocks. As a result of the government of Malawi's efforts to restock, the Department of National Parks and Wildlife entered into a management concession with investors to manage the reserve. From 2003 to 2009, a total of over 2,900 animals of different species have been reintroduced. We would want to make sure that uh, whatever resource development has been done here is sustained to, to a longer level. That um, I think much as we are enjoying now, but we can leave this uh, legacy for posterity, that at least uh, Malawi developed a reserve for its own people. And I think uh, um, Malawi, through the Department of Wildlife, have really supported this project. I think at the stage where we are in Malawi today, uh, we are getting that recognition that uh, the government of Malawi has uh, you know, undertaken serious steps to develop its wildlife resources. And so, therefore, you know, the fact that the wildlife populations are beginning to breed and they are becoming visible to people, you can see even government is investing you know, in improving its staff accommodation. Uh, we are developing capacity so that staff is able to do its work properly. Uh, we are putting on roads, we are putting a, a, lot, of, a lot of other you know, infrastructure. And uh, this is what you know makes you know a protected area you know attractive to visitation because uh, it's not good to just market Malawi. You have to develop the attractions so that when the tourism tourists come to Malawi, they are not disappointed. In 1992, in Nika National Park. There was 1,203 eland and 2,184 reedback population. However, with poaching, these were reduced to 523 and 658 respectively. The Department of National Parks and Wildlife is pursuing a comprehensive policy which embraces stakeholder involvement and participants as an important tool for effective management of protected areas. The recommendations further says that this needs to happen urgently and local communities surrounding protected areas must benefit. Nika National Park is considered as Malawi's gem with savanna grasslands and scattered trees. The park is home to different species of animal, including zebra and antelopes. The community around Nika National Park benefit from the park and work hand in hand with park officials to ensure that poaching, which is a big threat, is controlled. In return, the people are allowed access to the park to harvest wild mushrooms, thatching grass, and honey. Before uh, collaborative wildlife management came into being, we were um, uh, a purely policing entity, arresting and fines. We, we, we had no interface with the local communities. You know. so that approach was not working at all. So it was necessary that uh, we, we take uh, on board local community members to give a hand in the conservation efforts and also at the same time uh, to let them know that government was protecting this, uh, these areas you know, for their own good. So the key word there is a sustainable utilization of these resources. At present, the biggest threat to wildlife natural resources which are in protected areas is poaching. Poaching has a negative impact on tourism. When animals in protected areas are poached, their population decreases and are rarely seen. This then affects the numbers of visitors to these protected areas as the principal reason of going there 